How you guys doing? How you hanging in there after the GameStop debacle? I'm doing, uh... I'm doing good. Doing real good. Now, you guys, you guys want me to air out my dirty laundry. I know you do. <laughs> and I'm happy to do it, okay? So, you know, GameStop hype started going. Uh, I, I bought in quite a bit. I don't remember the starting amount. I think it was originally $20,000. And, I, you know, I was buying and selling here and there, so I don't know exactly what my cost basis was. And at my peak, I was up $55,000. Did not sell like an idiot because I was having too much fun with the memes, and I, I was just I was sucked into it so hard. And uh, wrote it all the way back down, so I gave up all my gains and also gave up gave up my gains that I've made in my account since last September. So went went from up fifty five thousand dollars to down like twenty thousand dollars. So I had a ton of fun. It was some of the most expensive entertainment I've ever ever had, but uh, it was entertainment nonetheless, and I was having a blast. I understand what happens with these meme stocks is they always crash, and I was trying to I was trying to shoot for gold, but I did not. Admit defeat when brokerages stopped allowing people to buy. I was too stubborn. So, you know, I paid the price and it's fine. Had a great time doing it. Anyway, I'm still bag holding like 180 GameStop shares and I'm transferring them and my other positions over to Webull, which kind of ties into what we're talking about today. It's why did Robinhood stop people from buying GameStop and AMC and other volatile securities? What's the deal? You know, a lot of people are saying they're colluding with hedge funds or, they're, you know, they're, they're helping out short sellers. They're just trying to screw over the little guy. And while possible, I don't think that's a rational explanation for what's going on. But I want to explain what happened, why they actually stopped you from buying GameStop. So let's just do that really quick, and I'll, I'll lay out my case. Okay, if you still think they're colluding with hedge funds to screw us over, you know, given the history of Wall Street, I can't necessarily bl blame you. And it's entirely possible that there's more to this story than, than I know, because this is all new information to me. And we'll see what comes up when there's that hearing with Vlad. Uh, Robin Hood CEO here in the next couple weeks or week or so. Before I get into this, I just want you to have a taste of how Vlad, uh, the CEO of Robin Hood, tried to explain what was happening uh, behind the scenes that prevented them from allowing you to buy GameStop and AMC and other stocks. So here's a taste of Vlad, the stock impaler, and his explanation for why they stopped uh, you from buying GameStop? Uh, the reason we did it was because uh, Robinhood is a brokerage firm. Uh, we have lots of financial requirements, including SEC net capital requirements and clearinghouse deposits. So that's money that we have to deposit at various clearinghouses. So some of these requirements uh, fluctuate quite a bit based on volatility in the markets. And they can be substantial in the current environment where there's a lot of volatility and a lot of concentrated activity in, uh, in these names that have been going viral on social media. So we're really in unprecedented times. And in order to protect the firm and protect our customers, um, we had to limit buying in these, in these stocks. Did that make any sense? When I watched that, I was lost. And when I read the statements they put out, I was lost, okay? They put out another statement that was just redundant and basically just saying, we have the customer in mind and we're on your side. We're gonna get through this together. But they never could articulate what was happening. And a lot of people assume that's because they were up to no good and it's, you know, it's possible. But my personal belief is that they're just stupid. It had to come out of the CEO's mouth and the CEO, I don't even think, understands how their company works. So let me explain what was going on and why they prevented you from buying those securities. When you enter a buy order on Robinhood or any brokerage, it gets routed to an exchange, right? The New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, you know, whatever exchange you're doing the trade on. And you get matched up with a seller. And for you, on, on your perspective, from your perspective, this is basically it. That's the end of the story. Uh, you see the shares if you're buying in your account instantly, that's it. But really, there's actually quite a bit that goes on behind the scenes that you're not entirely aware of when you're just looking at the UI of your brokerage. If it were just this, there would be a couple problems. Number one, there's no one to re-register the, the, the stock in the, in the new buyer's name. There's no one to log the trade, really. There's nobody to get rid of something called counterparty risk, which is the risk that one party defaults. Maybe the buyer delivers the funds, but the seller's brokerage defaults or the individual himself or herself defaults and, does, and fails to deliver the shares, well, then the buyer's really hung out to dry. So we want to get rid of this, this, this thing that is called counterparty risk. So to you know, log the trade, re-register the stock, and to get rid of counterparty risk, there is another financial entity called a clearinghouse. 
And so as soon as a buyer and a seller are matched up on the exchange, they shake hands, it no longer becomes a, a trade between the buyer and the seller necessarily. It becomes between the buyer and the clearinghouse as well as the seller. So now the clearinghouse is the counterparty to both sides. The clearinghouse is called the central counterparty because they are the counterparty to both sides. And what the clearinghouse it does is one, they re-register the stock, two, they log the trade, and three, they guarantee that both parties get the assets they initially wanted. And so for the buyer, that would be the shares. For the seller, that would be the funds. They are guaranteed by the clearinghouse to get the assets that were agreed upon. And because they guarantee your assets will be delivered into your account, you see that immediately. But in reality, that's not actually what happens. It actually takes today plus two day trading days, so T plus two, for the assets to exchange hands, for the seller's shares to go all the way through the clearinghouse and get registered, you know, get... Uh, get logged and all that jazz and then into the buyer's pockets and same with the the funds to go from the buyer all the way to the seller it takes today plus two trading days and that is the settlement period it takes today plus two trading days for the trade to settle for the assets to actually physically switch um, counterparties hands and for it to be logged and re-registered but because the clearinghouse promises promises, promises that they're going to give you your assets. You see them immediately. And because they make that promise, counterparty risk no longer exists. You do not have to worry about your counterparty defaulting on you and leaving you out in the rain. Now, this is a pretty big promise, right? You know, what if one party defaults? It's a pretty big promise that the clearinghouse will front that side of the trade. How are they able to do this? Well, it's because they actually take some small deposits from brokerages. So we're going to put Robin Hood down here. These deposits that go into the clearinghouse for every trade are called margin. The clearinghouse sets these things called margin rates, which are a percentage of the value of the trade. So if this buyer and this seller are trading $100 worth of stock and the clearinghouse sets the margin rate at 10%, Robinhood has to deposit 10% of the value of the trade, aka $10, 10% of $100 is $10, as collateral in case either party defaults. So again, maybe the, maybe the clearinghouse sets a 10% uh, margin rate and the value of this trade is $100. So the margin that Robinhood has to deposit in this example is $10 for the trade. And they're doing this for every single trade. So this margin is deposited into the clearinghouse to make sure that if the buyer, if the buyer defaults, the seller gets their cash and they will front shares on the seller side to make sure that the, if the seller defaults, the buyer will get their shares. So these funds, this margin has nothing to do with the seller. It's to cover in case the buyer defaults. And that'll come into play here in just a minute. So those funds, this margin stays in the clearinghouse for the total sell settlement period of today plus two trading days. So it stays there for two full trading days and cannot come out until the trade has settled, until the assets have exchanged, hand exchanged hands and there hasn't been a default, then Robinhood gets their funds back. Okay, let's take a look at this, uh, this margin rate right here. What determines that rate? Well, the clearinghouse sets it, but they use statistical models to determine what the, uh, the margin rates are for a particular stock. And they're kind of complicated, but uh, the main driver or a big driver behind it is volatility. The more volatile the stock is, the higher the margin rates are going to be. I'm not going to go into why exactly because it's just going to muddle things. But as volatility of a stock increases, so does the margin rates. And what happened with uh, GameStop? Well, it was super volatile, right? You probably know this. It was super volatile. So what happened to the margin rates? They rocketed to the, to the, to the moon. For Webull, their margin rates were 100% through their clearinghouse. For Robinhood, it might have been somewhere close. But what that means is if it's somewhere close to 100%, Robinhood is having to front 100% of the notional value of the trade for the buyer in case the buyer defaults. That is a lot of money because they're doing this for tens of millions of trades on GameStop alone, which is billions and billions of dollars that is getting deposited into the clearinghouse in case the buyer defaults. And it stays there for two whole trading days. Two whole trading days. So they're depositing billions of dollars once, once every day. It happens once in the morning. And it's staying there for two full trading days. Robinhood does not have that kind of balance sheet that's nice and juicy. Okay, they're, They have thin margins. They would not stay solvent if they kept this up. And so they had to limit the buying of GameStop and other volatile securities for this reason. And you could still sell. Okay, You could still sell because... This margin is just for the buyer. But what did that make that look? What did it look like though? It made it look like they just cut off buying and allowed selling. It was it was in the seller's favor, right? Why not why not pause both buying and selling? Well, I don't know. Gee, would you want to be stuck with a massive position in GameStop with no ability to get rid of it? 
I don't think so. So they had legitimate reason to cut off buying and yet it looked so freaking bad. And this is what happened. There's similar stories with other brokerages as well. So this is what was happening behind the scenes. Okay, billions of dollars going into the clearinghouse. Robinhood was not going to be able to stay solvent, so they had to cut it off early in anticipation that the, the margin rates were going to stay high over the next week or so. So they had to cut it off in order to stay solvent, in order to not put the, the, prom, the bearing of the promise on the clearinghouse alone, and then the clearinghouse would go insolvent perhaps, and then there's a whole market breakdown. It'd be a mess. And people are saying, that's a load of bullshit. Well, how can that be bullshit if a bunch of other brokerages did the same thing. Are you telling me that all the brokerages got together in a cigar smoked room, talked to each other, talked to hedge funds, talked to short sellers and broke and said break and they broke out and they all said the exact same story so that the kids screw over the little guy. Odds are slim. We'll see as more news arises. I've given this video time, given some days to see if any information pops up. I do not see a good argument that these financial institutions are trying to screw us over. <laughs> I'm not going to Webull because I think Robin Hood's colluding with other financial institutions. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I'm going to Webull because Vlad did not lead in a time that required leadership. Okay, I think that actually basically covers it. Uh, thanks to everyone who followed me along on Twitter. Um, while I was doing the GameStop shenanigans. I hope you guys are doing all right through all that. Of course, never risk money you're not willing to lose. I had a blast. I hope at least you guys had some entertainment. And as I read on Wall Street Bets, maybe the real short squeeze was the friends we made along the way. I'll catch you guys in the next one.